9 p.m. at Bangkok Airport on Saturday, January the 5th. 18-year-old Saudi Arabian citizen Rahaf Muhammad al kanun arrives on a flight from Kuwait. She's desperate and on the run. دفعت التذاكر بعدين طلعت الصباح لما أهلي ناموا وصلت المطار فكل شيء صار بسرعة. Rahaf has a valid Australian tourist visa. She had planned to spend a few days in Bangkok before flying on to Melbourne and seeking asylum in Australia. But she is stopped as soon as she gets off her flight. استقبلني شخص. طبعا كذب عليه وقال راح اساعدك تسوين فيزا لتايلاند تدخلين لكن في الحقيقه هو يشتغل مع السفاره السعوديه اخذ جوازي كان السبب هو بلاغ اهلي اني هربت فيعتقدوا اني لازم ارجع Rahaf is detained and told she has no choice but to return on the next flight despite her insistence this will place her in danger She's told her passport is cancelled and she won't be allowed into Thailand. No, you cannot I, videotape me. No, just tell me that I have come back to Saudi Arabia. You said that. Uh -huh. Yes, you have. Why? Uh, because your visa is not granted, okay? When you are rejected, visa is. But I'm in danger. Huh? I'm in danger. You're dangerous? Yeah, it is so dangerous to me. What do you mean so dangerous to you? Saudi Arabia. I can't go back. You can't go back. You just have to board the Kuwait Airlines back. Not so good, right? Yeah, not so good. Because just you came in with Kuwait Airlines, right? Yeah. It's gonna be flight KU412 tomorrow at 11.15. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Rahaf is sent to the airport transit hotel, under guard and blocked from leaving. She sends out an urgent SOS message. I am the girl who escaped from Kuwait to Thailand. My life is at stake, and I am now in real danger if I am forcibly returned to Saudi Arabia. Her plight spreads on social media, reaching activists around the world. I couldn't live with myself if this was a real person and I didn't do what I could to help her. So of course I, I went and checked her tweets after and then I began to translate them into English. And then I just asked people, you know, you know, just tweet about this. Then I DM'd her and I said to her, Rahaf, we need to see your face. People need to see you so that they can believe that you exist. My name is Rahaf Muhammad. Uh, I'm 18 years old. I can't do anything because they have my passport. And tomorrow they will force me to go back to Kuwait. And I'm here. Please help me, they will kill me. I saw Rahaf's tweets on Sunday morning and made contact with her. Has anybody come to your room to help you? No. I, can, can you leave your room or what? What are they outside? Uh, I have a security outside. I flew to Bangkok to cover her story. By the time I arrive, she's due to be deported within hours. I slip past the security guards and join Rahaf inside her hotel room. I'm hungry and tired. When was the last time you slept? Three days ago. What about ate properly? Right. When was the last time you ate properly? Um, I think yeah, yesterday. So no food today, yeah? Mm -hmm. mm. How long are you planning on staying in the room? 
I don't know. As I can. Mm. Rahaf decides to barricade herself inside this room. I'm not leaving my room until I see UNHCR. Uh, I want uh, asylum. The dramatic plea to the UN from 18-year-old Rahaf Mohammed al Kanun of Saudi Arabia. I'm not leaving my room until I see UNHCR. More than a day after her arrival, 18-year-old Rahaf Mohammed al Kanan was still barricading herself in her airport hotel room. That is Rahaf Mohammed al Kanun in one of the many desperate pleas for help that she has been sending out on social media. She's believed to be the daughter of a senior Saudi government official. There was no going back for Rahaf now. So not only has she escaped, not only has she said, I'm asking for asylum, not only has she said, I renounce Islam, not only has she said, my family will kill me if I go back, but we now find out that her father is a very important man. So that is just a combination of all of these things and it just made it even more urgent that this, there is no way this young woman can be sent back on a plane to Saudi Arabia. Rahaf knows other Saudi women who managed to escape to Australia successfully. I have a friend there and uh, she said uh, it's a good country. They have rights for women and uh, I can work, I can study there. So that's what I want to go to Australia. I read a lot about the weather and, uh, you know, what can you do in Australia? Uh, some stuff and meeting people and uh, beach, a lot of things like this. And what did you learn about women in Australia? Uh, about what? Women. About women. Yeah. Like the rights. They have everything. Like everything. You can do everything that we can do. As the hours pass, there are people outside the room trying to get Rahaf to open the door. Yes? Who are you? An official from Kuwait Airways has just knocked at the door. Um, and tried to get Rahaf to leave. Um, she's refused. She's made a barricade with a table and some mattresses and um, uh, they've tried all kinds of ways of enticing her out of the room, offering breakfast and then lunch. And uh, she says she's not leaving and that she wants to speak to the UN. Thai officials are now at the door, telling Rahaf she has to leave. You don't have asylum in this country. You cannot take asylum in Thailand. You don't have asylum? Not here in Thailand. Uh, the Thais are saying uh, that Rahaf hasn't formally sought asylum. And she hasn't because she hasn't had the chance. Uh, she's, she's been asking, and I've witnessed this since 7 a.m. this morning, um, asking to talk to Thai immigration officials to, to say that she wants to seek asylum, to formally make that claim. Um, but they, they never came. She asked for two hours. So before she barricaded herself in the room, she was trying to do that, but wasn't given the chance. Time passes inside room 303. Then a small victory, as we learn that the flight they were trying to force Rahaf on has left. Um, the Kuwait Airways flight has left. Seriously? Thanks. There's an Egypt Airways flight uh -huh. in 15 minutes. But the Kuwait flight has left. Oh, good. There's more people at the door, 
trying again to entice Rahaf out. They claim the UN is here, but we know from checking with contacts that is a lie. Rahaf logs into her Australian immigration profile, but her account no longer seems to be working. That's your Australian visa account. It looks like it's been cancelled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It didn't look like this before? No. Rahaf's been in this room for more than 24 hours. Well, throughout today, this hotel has been the scene of extraordinary comings and goings with officials going in and out, trying to persuade the young Saudi woman to come out of her room. At one point, we thought she'd be deported. Now we know that Thailand has given her an entry permit, the UN is involved, and her request for asylum, they say, will be properly assessed. Inside the room, we have heard nothing officially from the UN. There's another knock at the door. The UNHCR is here. Can you please um, open the door, I did, I did. I did. No. Rahaf doesn't believe at first that it's them. You have to prove. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you are human rights. officials would only come into Rahaf's room if I came out um, and they looked me in the eye and they promised that she would be safe now they said she would remain in their custody um, and they would do everything in their powers to make sure that nothing happened to her and they're now conducting an interview um, with Rahaf about her asylum claims and this is what they promised. Rahaf is taken to a hotel downtown under tight Thai police guard. The next day, her father and brother fly into Bangkok to try to force her home. The Saudi embassy meets with Thai officials on their behalf. <laughs> There is pressure on Australia to take Rahaf. There is no special treatment in this case. The case will be assessed uh, by the United Nations and uh, that's, it doesn't therefore make it different to any other case uh, of that nature. The UNHCR approves Rahaf's asylum claim under a fast track system for those facing immediate threats to their life. They refer her case to Australia, and Rahaf is taken to the Australian Embassy in Bangkok to process her case. The next day, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne arrives in the Thai capital on a short visit. There is no possibility that uh, Ms Alkanen will be going back with, uh, with me, uh, as you put it, today. Uh, that is because there are steps which are required in the process which Australia uh, and uh, any um, other country considering uh, such a matter would have to go through. Uh, we will go through those according to our own system and our own processes. Is there a time frame for that? Not a specific time frame, no. By Friday morning, there is still no decision from Australia and the UN is increasingly worried about Rahaf's security. They take her to the Canadian Embassy, where her visa is approved in a matter of hours. She will fly out to Toronto tonight. Okay. 
I travelled to Canada to meet up again with Rahaf. She still can't believe she made it. حسيت إني حرة وإنه لقيت من جديد وكان شيء رائع وفرحني لأني لقيت كثير من المحبة والاستقبال. أكيد الحرية هي أهم شيء للإنسان. أنا تخليت عن كل شيء عشان أكون حرة. Under Saudi Arabia's male guardianship system, a man controls a woman's life from birth until her death. Every Saudi woman must have a male guardian, normally a father or husband, who has the power to make critical decisions on her behalf. ما أقدر أتزوج شخص اللي أبيه ما أقدر أتوظف إلا موافقته لي أمري نظام الولاية يحدد المرأة مصيرها إيش ممكن تتوظف إيش ممكن تشتغل حتى السافة ممنوعة فيه فإحنا النساء السعوديات نتعامل كأننا قاصرات حتى لو كان عمر المرأة خمسين وستين Sometimes that male guardian can be the teenage son of a professor who just doesn't feel like giving her the permission she needs to travel. So this is incredible power given to their male guardians that renders them, renders women in Saudi Arabia perpetual minors. And I call this state-sanctioned patriarchy a form of gender apartheid. Escaping is not easy. There's really two methods for doing this that I've seen. One is they hack into their father's phone and change the permission settings for their travel. Uh, they steal their passport somehow uh, if they don't have it and, you know, run to the airport, get out of the country, you know, as soon as they can. The other method is if the family takes a vacation, they flee and abscond while outside the country. So we have seen in some instances when women do this, they try to flee abroad to other, other places. The Saudi state is active in exerting its diplomatic influence to try to interdict them. Saudi woman Dina Ali Laslum is one of those that tried to escape to Australia but didn't make it. In April 2017, the 24-year-old was stopped in the Philippines while she was in transit on her way to Sydney. She came up to me and I was like, hi. And she said, hi. She said, can I use your cell phone? And I asked, why? And she said, I just, something's wrong with my flight. I said, okay, sure. And I gave her my cell phone. Canadian Megan Khan was sitting in the Manila Airport Transit Lounge when she was approached by Dina Ali. She told Megan that her passport had been confiscated by an official from the Saudi Embassy. Megan was with her as she tried to talk to Philippine Airlines staff. They said, I'm sorry, but an important person called and told us to hold her documents and not allow her to leave. And they did not tell me who this important person was. She was crying, she's like, Megan, they're not trying to help me. They're not listening to me. They're just waiting for my family to come who wants to kill me. And that was the first time she said that to me. And that's when I was, what are you talking about? And that's when she started sharing, Megan, I'm Saudi, and I'm not allowed to go anywhere on my own. I wasn't allowed to travel on my own. I'm trying to get to Australia to seek asylum. I, I couldn't believe it, to be honest. I was in complete shock. Dina Ali told Megan she had escaped from a violent family and a life with no freedom to make her own decisions. The two young women began to desperately try and contact anyone who could help. We tried to call um, a lot of human rights numbers that we were literally Googling off online. We were calling everyone. Her friends were sending us Snapchat. We were literally just in mission mode. Our mission was to find someone to come into the airport and help us. And I called every single person possible. I called the police station in Manila. I called the local Manila newspapers. I left voicemails for dozens of people. Dina Ali asked Megan to record a video documenting her plight. 
My name is Dinali and I'm a Saudi woman who fled Saudi Arabia to Australia to seek asylum. I stopped in Philippines for translate. They took my passport and locked me for 13 hours just because I'm a Saudi woman with the collaboration of Saudi NBC. If my family come, they will kill me. If I go back to Saudi Arabia, I will be dead. Please help me. I'm recording this video to help me and know that I'm real and here. And then Dina Ali's worst fears were realised. And I remember she was sitting, eating the sandwich, and she, she was holding it, and then she just stopped. And I was, I looked at her and like, what's wrong? And she said, um, Megan, they're here. And I, I was like, what? She said, Megan, they're here, send a video. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, what are you talking about? And they turned around and they saw these two guys and this lady. And I said, and to be honest, one of the uncles looks a lot like Dina. And I said, is that your uncles? And she's like, those are my uncles. And I'm like, oh my God. And I was sitting back down trying to take pictures and at this point her uncle got up and he's like, what are you doing? Get the, don't take pictures. Give me your phone. Delete those pictures. Megan filmed Dina Ali pleading with airline staff for help. That's when I was like really, I was crying a lot and Dina was crying a lot at this point. Dina Ali's uncles left the transfer area. A man purporting to be a lawyer arrived, promising to help get back her passport and ticket. Feeling hopeful it was going to be okay, Megan Khan went to catch her flight. I heard from Dina the next morning. She called me and when she called me, she was crying and she said, my uncles tricked me and they tried to get me onto a flight back to Saudi Arabia and they have me locked up in a room right now. She was crying and she told me she was beaten. And I felt like, I guess I didn't care really how I felt. I think I was in shock. I was just like, I need help. I like, what am I doing? Why did I leave? I, I felt really bad. I, I, I felt really bad. I felt like I left her. I felt like I left her. Another passenger filmed as Dina was dragged screaming to the plane. Well, the guard who had been responsible for, for keeping an eye on Dina while she was at the airport hotel, he was really quite horrified by what he had seen. They beat her, they taped her mouth shut, they bound her arms and legs together and dragged her onto a plane, kicking and screaming, and nobody did anything. They essentially forcibly abducted her and took her to the airplane, uh, and these would have been apparently her uncles as well as airline officials uh, duct taped uh, Dina's mouth shut uh, they duct taped her hands together, they duct taped her to a wheelchair, threw a blanket over her. And we did hear from other passengers uh, who landed in Riyadh that a woman was dragged onto the plane screaming. Dina Ali Laslum has not been heard of publicly since. I wish I could say we could have done better. If I could do a list of things we did better, I, I would. You know, one of those would be I wouldn't have left. It's not worth it to leave. It's better to stay. It's better to stay. It's, an, it's not an expensive flight to be there for. It's, it's just a phone. You know, this person's life. Give them the phone. 
you know, there's things I learned in that situation that I would do differently for her. What happened to Dina Ali now has become this awful, traumatizing, worst case scenario for Saudi women who try to escape and seek asylum. The Saudi embassy in Manila issued a statement calling the case a family matter and saying that Dina Ali had returned with her relatives to the homeland. What we understand and we've heard from uh, sources inside Saudi Arabia is that she was taken to a women's shelter uh, in Riyadh and held there for a period of time. Uh, after that, the trail more or less goes cold and there's not a lot of public information. But in Saudi Arabia, women's shelters operate more like de facto prisons and alleged abusers of women are protected by the state. Saudi women who attempt to approach police, for example, to report abuse by uh, a male family member, for example, uh, sometimes they go to a police station or they call the police station and uh, uh, somebody there will tell them, well, you can't, you know, you can't come here, you can't make a complaint unless your male guardian is with you. And in many cases, that person would be the abuser. It's believed Dina Ali was initially taken here to a closed women's shelter in Riyadh. These state-run institutions, called Da al Rayas, are where women who disobey the male guardianship system or shame their families end up, including victims of domestic violence. They are found in cities and towns throughout Saudi Arabia. When they enter, um, uh, many of them don't realize that these shelters are entirely closed, right? Once they go in, they can't get out. Uh, the state isn't going to release them to go live on their own. You're treated with, um, in an indignified way as a prisoner, not as a, a survivor or a victim of domestic violence. So you're locked, you're not allowed to finish your education or get a job, you're not allowed to even make phone calls. So the way they treated women in shelters, government-run shelters, was really humiliating to women. Manal al-Sharif is one of Saudi Arabia's most renowned female rights activists. She now lives in self-imposed exile in Sydney. 2 a.m., they knock on my door, the secret police, and that means you are a threat to the national security in my country. But the worst part is not being locked in that shelter. The worst part, you can't leave that shelter without having a male guardian getting you out of that. And that male guardian could be your abusive husband, your abusive fa father or brother. So what they do, they find them husbands who are willing to marry them. That's the reality of women who run away from abusive relationship in Saudi Arabia. In some cases, we've actually seen them encourage women to uh, get married to strangers who will take them out and then become their new male guardians. And, and f some women actually do that. They just say, you know, we'll roll the dice and hopefully we'll have a better chance with a new person. We've become very good friends over a fairly short period of time. Since Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman took power in 2017, he's been selling himself to the world as a reformer. Are women equal to men? Absolutely. We are all human beings and there's no difference. MBS, as he's known, proudly announced that Saudi women would be finally given the right to drive. This is no longer an issue. Today, driving schools have been established and will open soon. In a few months, women will drive in Saudi Arabia. We are finally over that painful period that we cannot justify. Manal al-Sharif was briefly jailed in 2011 for staging a protest calling for women to be allowed to drive. She was excited by the thought of real reform in her home country, but it didn't last. So I was really hopeful, and I think it wasn't only me, it was a lot of Saudi youth. And when the risks happened, I knew that's the moment that it is not what we thought. It was all a propaganda. Just before the driving ban was lifted, the Crown Prince oversaw a brutal crackdown, arresting the Saudi women who had spent years campaigning for the right to drive. One of Manal's closest friends, 
Lujain al Hathlul was among those thrown in jail. On March 15, 2018, Lujain was kidnapped from Abu Dhabi. She was handcuffed, blindfolded, flown on a private jet to Riyadh, where she was interrogated and placed under a travel ban. In May, like a few weeks before the official date of lifting the ban, she was placed in a solitary confinement in a place that no one knows, even her own family didn't know where she was. There was like a wave of arrests amongst female activists. Aziza Yusuf, she's a grandmother. She's also a, a, a professor. Iman al Nafjan, she's a professor and, uh, and a blogger, a very famous uh, blogger in English language. She's a mother of four kids. Her youngest is a toddler. And this woman who's been put in custody without allegation, without charges, without trial, without access to lawyers or her family or her kids, who are these people doing this? One of the reasons I think that MBS and Saudi authorities moved against these women is they didn't want them claiming credit for reforms. They did not want the image that women had campaigned, had generated international pressure, and that Saudi Arabia had capitulated to that pressure. They wanted it instead to look like MBS had decided to become a benevolent ruler and liberate his women. The Saudi government also tried to pressure Manal al-Sharif to stay quiet about the lifting of the ban. I received a phone call from the National Security asking me not to talk about it or tweet about it. And I was in Australia. That was really strange. How did they get my Australian number? They encouraged her to visit Saudi Arabia, but she now believes they had sinister motives. And they were really keen. They asked me to go to the embassy here. They were really keen to grant my son a visa. And apparently it was just luring me to go back to Saudi Arabia to be put in jail. I barely escaped a very ill fate that is being um, served by my friends who fought for women's rights in my country. So you believe that they were trying to lure you back? Yes. Manal? Yes. And what do you think would happen if you'd gone back? I would definitely be in jail. Definitely. Human rights groups say the Saudi women activists have been tortured and abused in jail. They said that they'd been subjected to electric shocks, flogging and sexual harassment. And one of the relatives said that their detained relative could barely walk when they met them. Some of them had been hung from the ceiling. The Wall Street Journal also broke the story that Saud al-Qahtani, the same aide who was the one who um, conveyed MBS's orders to kill Jamal Khashoggi, was in the room when Lujain al-Hathlul was subjected to water waterboarding and that he himself threatened her with rape and threatened to murder her. Women um, have reported that they were subjected to various forms of brutal torture, including uh, electric shocks, including uh, whippings, including uh, sexual harassment, verbal threats, verbal threats of rape including, uh, um, included as well. The Saudis are increasingly working to enforce male guardianship outside their borders. I've come to Hong Kong to learn what happened to two Saudi sisters who were in transit here on their way to Sydney in September last year. News of their plight emerged via Twitter. Help me, please. They will kill me. I'm stuck in Hong Kong. I'm a Saudi girl with my sister. The Saudi Consul General was waiting for them when their plane landed. He confronted them at the airport. I came here transit from Colombo to go to Australia, but Consulate General of Saudi Arabia take my passport and cancel my flight. The sisters had valid Australian visas. They booked seats on the next Qantas flight, but an Australian Border Force official working in Hong Kong airport blocked them from boarding. I book another flight and they tell the immigration guy that I'm going to take asylums and he didn't allow us to go. Please, my family will kill me if I go back to Saudi. Please help us. 
the young women managed to flee the airport, but they remain trapped here in Hong Kong. The Department of Home Affairs cancelled their visas. The girls' passports have been cancelled, but there's no way they're going anywhere near the Saudi consulate to get them renewed. They've now been living here in hiding for four months, moving locations several times to avoid their family or the Saudi authorities tracking them down. Uh, they have the same story, of course. So I hope they will be safe in a safe place and not be afraid of them or not. ساعدوهم ولا توقفوا وجيهم لأنهم جدا جدا يحتاجون مساعدة ويوصلون البلد آمن. I've come to an apartment in the western suburbs of Sydney that is now being used as a safe house. At least 80 Saudi women have sought asylum in Australia in the last few years. These young women are among them. Yet even here, they won't reveal their identities because they don't feel safe. They all have harrowing stories of escape. It took me five years to plan it. So every time I try, it just failed. So eventually, it succeeded. We booked a late flight when he was asleep. So that gave us time to, to escape, yeah. In one week, I, I took everything I need. One small bag, nothing, nothing important. Just my life and my freedom. And I escaped. It wasn't easy. It's, it's a long journey to be here in Australia, but it's worth it. Even when Saudi women manage to make it all the way here, there's no guarantee they will get in. We've been told that Saudi women who arrive alone in Australian airports are being asked by Border Force officials why they are not travelling with a male guardian. Four Corners has evidence of two young Saudi women arriving at Sydney Airport and when they made their asylum claims clear to Australian officials, they were turned back. Two of these women went to the airport to pick up their friend, but she never came out. She was planning to uh, apply asylum here. She, she came from Saudi to Indonesia and from Indonesia to Sydney. They have not heard from her since. Then since that time, yeah, I, d I never heard about her or what happening to her. We tried actually to reach her, but we haven't heard from her anymore, yeah, again. Hopefully, hopefully, like, she's alive. Yeah, and she's a good will. But you don't know what but happened? But we don't know what happened to her. Some of these women here say they have been harassed and intimidated by Saudi men living in Australia, trying to coerce them into returning home. Four Corners has established that one of those men works for the Saudi Ministry of Interior. Yeah. I don't know how actually they got my email address. And what did he say? He just tried to meet me. Actually, he said, don't worry, we just, we will meet and chat. Of course, I refused and I said, no way. They're saying that we want to talk to you. Can, can, we meet, can we meet up in a coffee shop? We can get you what you want, what you like. We can get you, you can, we can offer you anything you want. They say, yeah, nothing's going to happen to you if you go back. Don't worry. We'll try to talk uh, with your male guardian that it's OK and nothing's going to happen to you. They lie to us so we can go back and not talk about what's happening in, in Saudi Arabia for women. So they want us to, to keep us silent. Like the majority of the Saudi women in Australia, these women are all here on bridging visas. They're terrified the Australian government might reject their asylum claims and send them back. 
I live with this fear every day because I know what's going to happen to me if I went back to Saudi Arabia. It's really hard to say that, but I'm not going back. I prefer to kill myself because anyway they will kill us, but with torture. <laughs> Rahaf Muhammad is now a free resident of Canada. Her dream is for women in Saudi Arabia to have the same rights she now has. I don't want to be able to kill them as I did, but I want to be able to change the laws in Saudi Arabia. And I don't want to be able to kill anyone or to be able to change anything in her life. Hey, everyone. When Rahaf escaped and when Rahaf forced her issue onto the global consciousness, thereby forcing onto the global consciousness the status of women in Saudi Arabia, I was like, thank you. Thank you, Rahaf. It took the plight of an 18-year-old young woman to finally make the world ask, what the fuck is Saudi Arabia doing to women that they are escaping? 